It's Erica and Steve on Spirit 105.3. Mine is Erica right now. Uh, it's just me. But uh, I'm not alone. Taya is here from Hillsong. Hi, Taya. Hi, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. Really glad to have you. Now, <laughs> we've never met before, so the easy way to start, I think the best way to start, is always <laughs> yes. with a little getting to know you session. So give us a class. We'll call it Taya 101. <laughs> for those who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Taya, and I... I am a married woman and have been for four years, so I just need to introduce myself fully. My last name is Gork Roger, and mm. it is long and confusing. It's kind of pronounced just as it's written, Gork Roger, and I am just shy of six foot. I'm 5'11". Mm. I've got curly, crazy hair, and from my accent, you're probably realizing I am not from here. I am Australian. Now, we're going to guess <laughs> Oregon, but... so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just so, Portland. <laughs> did, did you ever think you'd grow up to be a girl codger? No. A gal codger? A girl codger. <laughs> Listen, see, it is very difficult. You're doing a great job, Steve. I did not. My parents named me Taya because our last name was Smith. And so mm. they thought they just needed a, a little bit of flavor, you know, with, right. a, with a beautiful, um, consistent last name. I'll say it that way. Yeah. But they didn't think that I was going to marry someone with um, an interesting last name. So now when people see my name... They just look at me and smile, and I look at them and I say, what would you like me to pronounce first? Mm. Did you grow up in church? <laughs> I did. I did. Um, I grew up in a Christian household. I'm so grateful for uh, my parents who not only did we attend church, but we also served within church. We grew up around music. My dad was kind of the resident um, worship leader. And even my mom, even though um, unfortunately she is deaf more than she can hear. Mm. Um, it's it's quite a, a loss of percentage in both ears, and she's got hearing aids. But playing acoustic guitar and always teaching me to sing sweet songs to Jesus, and so I think she really helped foster that love of um, worshiping the Lord from a young age. And you say she's mostly deaf. How has that changed your relationship? Well, let me just say, my mom is the greatest lip reader ever, <laughs> and so even when we were, um, you know, growing up. She'd be driving and we would be in the back and I would say something under my breath. But let me tell you, I couldn't get away with anything in my household. My mom was <laughs> reading my lips and she's like, Taya, I can see every word coming out of your mouth. So yeah. to be honest, I think it's actually helped me read people, being sensitive towards other people and reading not just, say, what they're saying, but their body language, which is a great skill to have, but also sometimes I need to turn down that dial a little bit and not read as much into the body yes, language. Yeah, exactly. What about growing up in Australia would surprise us mostly as Americans? Well, I'm sure that if you've had Australians on the show, that they may have told a little white lie that um, we have a lot of, I mean, well, it is true. We do have a lot of animals that um, could do you harm if you came in to encounter them in many, <laughs> many places in Australia. Um, but there is something that is a little white lie, which is called a drop bear. So if you have an Australian and they tell you that there is such a thing as a drop bear, know that it's not true. And don't worry, there is not a bear that will drop out of the trees onto mm. you when you're walking along on the street. This is, is what they tell true. people. <laughs> this is what they tell people. And <laughs> I feel terrible. I have told one other person that. Mm. And um, then they left Australia and I forgot to tell them the truth that actually mm. I was only joking. And so for about three to four months, unbeknownst to me, they were walking along the streets, just looking up at the trees going, please don't drop on me. <laughs> but it's not true. So I'm, I did a terrible job of representing Australia. It is a beautiful nation. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, no, you guys seem to have a sense of humor that that story fits very well with, kind of <laughs> yeah. collectively, it seems like to me. We're very so, sarcastic, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the song Oceans, which you sang with Hillsong, mm -hmm. is one of those songs that just really has blessed people like on another level. It's just, it seems like, does that, is that song as special to you as it is to everyone else? I mean, you're very kind um, in saying that about Oceans. I have such a love for that song. It be given an opportunity to steward someone else's words and revelation of who Jesus is. Um, that's not lost on me. And then, to be honest, that song is actually a prayer. And it was mm -hmm. something that I would need to sing just as much as perhaps people, you know, hearing it for the first time or even for the 50th time. I grew up not thinking ministry was a job because in Australia it's more of a secular nation I didn't really grow up knowing that you could even work at a church as like a job or anything I knew that I would always serve within church but not necessarily step into ministry side of things and 
So I was working in retail and I knew I wanted to sing and I had prayed the prayer when I was 16, like, God, would you use me? You know, I love to sing, but whatever you want, that's, you know, that's what I care about. And so when I was gifted this song, I didn't even know if it would make the record. Like I didn't even, you know, my life changed when the Zion album came out, which is February 2013. And I was um, singing the song Oceans. And I'm so thankful that it was a prayer because it was literally giving me words to the season that I was about to walk into, which is, you know, God taking me to places where I would have no borders, that I would need to completely trust him wherever he would call me and that he would take me deeper, you know, further than any place that I've ever gone before. And I'm so grateful for that prayer because, again, it's been a prayer that has held me in places and you know, positions that I'm like, God, what am I doing here? I'm a country girl from Lismore. I'm not even from Sydney, let alone, you know, traveling to America and around the world getting to represent you. Like, I'm going to trust that you're going to anoint me for this, God, but I'm just going to be obedient to your Holy Spirit and step out in faith. And so I'm very grateful for that song, Oceans. So what was particularly special about Easter this year for you? Well, it's the most powerful you know, moment that we get to celebrate really other than Christmas time, which is Jesus's birth. And I don't know if it's technically the exact moment in the Jewish calendar <laughs> when they say it happened, but you know, Easter is everything as a Christian. Yeah. Um, we should never not celebrate it and never, you know, get away from it at all because it's, you know, the reason that we get to stand in the presence of God, the reason, you know, as a worship leader, um, it's not lost on me that I get to stand in the presence of God and I don't get knocked down, but rather I'm invited in and I'm allowed to even behold him. And, and it was special for me this year because I have this record that I've been working on just secretly, you know, for the last two years, just no pressure is good pressure for me. And it's coming out next month. And on Good Friday, I got to release my second single called All Eyes on You. It was a song that was about the difference that Jesus made in the heavenlies when he came down, he lived a perfect life. He came as humble as a baby. He lived a perfect life down here as a perfect sacrifice and died obedient to the Father, asking of him to come and sacrifice himself so that we could be reconciled back to our Heavenly Father. And so I'm just so grateful for Jesus. And I could talk about that forever. Tell us about the song For All My Life. Yes. So this was the last song that we wrote before we were then going to be, you know, in the studio for a week recording the songs we had written in in a a little trip that we made to America last year. It came out of a discussion. I was talking with John Guerra, who's my producer and one of my closest friends, and he's also a co-writer along with Hank Bentley. And Hank also co-produced this track. And we'd just been talking about my life up until this point, which essentially is just God's goodness and the fact that he just meets us when we say, God, here's my life, you can have it. I give you no boundaries, like you do whatever you want to do. And we were kind of just talking about what my life had looked up to this point. And then we wrote the chorus and we realized this is just my testimony put to melody. And it's based on scripture, which makes me excited to sing this, hopefully for the rest of my life, you know, that it's based on Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, which is trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And so I love that this is just a great constant reminder, particularly for me heading into this new season of getting to steward my own songs for the first time, my own expression in my own words and melodies of who Jesus is to me. Uh, What a great reminder that I'm not leaning on my own understanding. This is the Lord. I'm going to acknowledge, you know, him in all my ways, and I'm going to believe that he's going to make my path straight. So I'm really excited to get to to lead that song and that that would be the the lead single coming off uh, my upcoming record. Very exciting. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, one other thing, I saw on your Instagram, you posted something pretty profound, and it had to do with when Jesus died and, and was raised again, the whole universe changed. That was the sermon that had impacted me so much in 2019. It was the first conference I was invited to go to that wasn't, you know, at our own church. I was definitely praying oceans that time, like, Lord Jesus, please lead me. And I thought I was there to serve, but I really believe I was there just to receive and to pick up this revelation. Um, It's humble, seasoned pastor, Daryl W. Johnson. His whole ministry um, at this point in his life, he really just felt that he's there to help young worship leaders know who it is that we are actually worshiping and having a good sound theology behind us. And for that to be someone's mission as well is such a beautiful, humbling thing. And I'm so grateful for that. Again, shout out to, you know, local churches. It's meant to be multi-generational for a reason. And, 
you know, meant to lean into others' revelation of who Jesus is as well to spur us on. And I'm so grateful because that message impacted uh, my life. I couldn't get it out of my heart. I kept coming back to it. It's based on Isaiah 6 and then also Revelations 4 and 5. And it's the same kind of snapshot of heaven. And the difference was is that Jesus, uh, in between those two moments, he had come and he had I, you know, similar to what I was saying before, he'd lived the perfect life and he had died in obedience to the Father. And then three days later, he was risen again as our resurrected King. And he's sitting on the throne room in heaven. And in, in that snapshot, it gives particular beautiful and also crazy description of these creatures that are in heaven around, flying around the throne. And it's the seraphim and it says they're, they've got all these wings and everything. And then it's said in Isaiah 6 that they were it described that there were eyes on them, but they had to cover their eyes because he was so holy. The Lamb of God is so holy. Sitting on the throne, we can't look at him or anything like that, you know. And then Jesus came, he died, he was resurrected, and then he went back to heaven. And then in Revelations 4 and 5, it gives that exact um, scene in heaven. But this time it says those creatures, those seraphim, um, they're all eyes, and they were allowed to behold him. Plus there were also 24 elders that were welcomed into that scene in heaven and they were invited to worship him and they were invited to look upon him. So again, you know, it, it's not lost on me that in the Old Testament, when people were ministering in the Holy of Holies, they had to tie around a rope around their waist just in case they had secret sin that they hadn't divulged to anyone and they get knocked down dead in the presence of God. But because of Jesus and what he did on the cross and being resurrected and he is now interceding for us, you know, at the Father's right hand, because of everything that he did, we get to now be in the presence of God. We get to look at him. We get to worship him. And we don't get knocked down, even though, again, you know, we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of the Lord. Technically, we deserve that. Yet, because of Jesus, we have life, an abundant life, and we get to be in his presence. So it's still with me, Steve. (laughs) I can tell. And it's a what a, what a powerful story and a, a powerful thing to keep in, in your heart and on your mind. And thank you for sharing. Taya, it's been really great Aww. getting to know you. Thank you so much, Steve. It's been lovely to be here. Thanks for having me.